Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Conway Hall. And please, will you give a warm welcome to your host today, Samira Ahmed, and her guests, Helen Day, Tim Dunn, and John Grindrod. Good evening and welcome to Conway Hall. I'm Samira Ahmed. I present Front Row on Radio 4 and Newswatch on BBC One. And sometimes I'm here where I have an excuse to talk about interesting things like Ladybird Books. We've got a hashtag if you want to tweet um, tonight during the evening, um, London Thinks. And um, a special thank you to, there's a couple of mums in the audience, so thank you. And also Miriam Malaya, the artist who did uh, We Go to the Galleries here. And I think there are other people with, related to Ladybird uh, books of different kinds. So do make yourselves known when we do the Q&A, and I'll, Miriam will be talking a little bit about her books shortly too. Tonight we're reconstructing the future past of Britain through Ladybird books. I'm guessing many of us are here because we grew up with their imagery, which burnt itself onto our imaginations. I grew up in Kingston-upon-Thames, and my childhood memory of going shopping in Bentall department store is uh, captured forever in a big store and it's it's quite amazing because it is actually my childhood um, in that illustration right quick test who knows the connection between that book and JG Ballard the book um, Kingdom Come which is set in the Bentall Center um, when a cult of people start worshiping um, the sort of the shopping gods as such um, so it all connects to in a big store so that's my little story um, the other story I wanted to share was that the ex-Muslim atheist campaigner, Ian Hersey Ali, wrote in one of her autobi autobiographies about how when she was being taught English in a fundamentalist religious school, they were given ladybird books to read, but told to cover up the illustrations because they were haram. And that idea seems so horrific, doesn't it? Tonight we're going to get an insight into the stories behind the books and then talk about why they have their power. And for me in particular, in putting this panel together, I wanted to explore some of the nostalgia about them and how far it's misplaced, especially in Brexit Britain. We want to look at the way these books celebrated major infrastructure projects, from um, rebuilding um, Coventry in concrete to the plans for HS2 and London's Garden Bridge. And I know you probably will buy it every week anyway, um, because it's got so many great articles, but I've written a piece in this week's big issue um, which is all about revisiting Ladybird Bookland um, in the modern, modern day um, and how far we've misremembered it. So I'll introduce our panel, and they've all got beautifully illustrated presentations, and then we'll have a discussion, and then definitely a chance to ask questions. So I hope you think up some good ones. Uh, John Grindrod grew up in Croydon. Yay! Is the author, <laughs> <laughs> is the author of um, Concretopia and has been studying the locations and the story of urban planning. Our land and the making indeed. He runs a wonderful modernist blog called Dirty Modern Scoundrel and he has a new book coming out next year on the Greenbelt. Helen Day is a collector and historian of Ladybird books and pretty much the authority on them. Her website, Ladybird Fly Away Home, is a fantastic resource about the books, about collecting them, the artists and the writers behind them, and how they've been translated and used abroad, notably in the Arab world. They don't like pigs there. And Tim Dunn is, well, you call yourself the model village guy, currently mapping model villages around the UK, an expert on model railways, involved in setting up the new postal museum, which is opening very close by, is that right? And, and is one of the presenters of Train Spotting Live on BBC Four, of course, and writes regularly for the London Transport Museum blog. So they'll each be giving us a presentation, and then we'll get talking. Uh, John, over to you first. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Hello. So, um, adjust your knitted ties, um, <laughs> pack away your nylon ponchos, polish those NHS specs. Uh, we're going back in time. Now, uh, this one feels like a familiar ladybird image, doesn't it? The height of suburban coziness. But don't get too comfortable. <laughs> because it wasn't really like that. In post-war Britain, there was a desire to rip it up and start again. The country was politically reshaped in the post-war years through nationalisation, slum clearance, the creation of the NHS and the welfare state. And Ladybird books were right there, showing a country starting over with a positive, optimistic vision. 
They are a perfect example of how dreams of modernity were embedded into the culture of the times, from the transistor radio to the moon landings. Now, this evening, I'm not only going to prove to you that Ladybird were forward thinking, they were also way ahead of those other seers of the modern age, German synth pioneers craft work. <coughs> You'll see. <laughs> So I'm starting with how Ladybird depicted place. Uh, the world that we were building in the post-war era, clearing away slums and blitz damage to create efficient new houses, flats, roads and offices, was enthusiastically represented by Ladybird in series including people at work, achievements and how it works. Now this is my hometown of Croydon, <laughs> illustrated by local artist Bernard Robinson. A concrete landscape of flyovers, tower blocks and underpasses that so epitomises the world that many of us grew up in. Here's a man drawing uh, plans up for the modern world. And you can tell it's a modern world because it's got a flat roof. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the draftsman's office. No draft women in evidence. In this instance, they're planning roads, but this could be a scene from offices of any number of local authorities, county councils, or even mega architects like Richard Seaford. However, they're probably planning motorways. Britain's first opened in 1958, the Preston Bypass. This, the roads in this image look much more high-tech than the cars on them. Just as they do on the cover <laughs> of Kraftwerk's seminal 1974 album, Autobahn, released some seven years after People at Work, The Roadmakers. <laughs> this was a Britain of holes, holes where bombs had fallen or where Industrial Revolution era buildings had stood, a world caught in transition. What's incredible about this 1965 book is that rather than just focus on traditional building techniques, it shows construction using steel frames, the very epitome of modern architecture. There's a reinforced concrete frame being erected too. And here are large concrete panels being hefted into place. This is system building, the ubiquitous technique of the 1960s that allowed millions around the country to be rehoused. In a few years' time, says the text, most of our homes and many other buildings will be prefabricated. The collapse of a badly constructed tower block, Ronan Point, in 1968, certainly slowed down that particular dream. This post-war house from, 1964 Peter and Jane, from a 1964 Peter and Jane book is a classic tile-fronted design. But Peter and Jane's world grows more brutal over time. A later version of the series from 1973 shows a tower block in view from their front door. <laughs> And here's the most joyous representation of council housing you could imagine. These towers were based on a style made popular in Sweden called a point block. When carefully planned and sited, the text goes, they can be as beautiful in their way as the best homes of the past. You may know these actual blocks. There were four groups of them around London, in Camberwell, Battersea, Rotherhive and Wandsworth, all designed by Colin Lucas in 1964. This book, Homes, from 1975, shows a fantasy second wave new town like Cumbernauld or Redditch. Here is Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water as if reimagined by Croydon School's architect department. <laughs> Many Ladybird readers in the mid 60s would have spent their days in brand new prefabricated schools. Architects such as Mary and David Med in Hertfordshire used system building to speed up construction. And behind Peter and Jane's mustard-coloured Austin Maxi, you can see another example. There is a tonal difference between Ladybird books from the 60s and the 70s, which I know Helen is going to talk a lot more about later. And you can see this clearly here, with a hippie-ish swipe from 1974 that cars fill our streets, 
Big car parks have to be made. Often they are ugly. <laughs> Cars take up space at home. is even more cross. Hertfordshire had built 100 prefabricated schools before the first new NHS hospital had been finished anywhere in Britain. It looks for all the world as if Hattie Jakes has just chased Kenneth Williams <laughs> into the back of that Morris van only moments before. <laughs> there is an enormous overlap between the subject matter, if not the tone, of Lady Bear books and Carry On films. <laughs> Modernism seeped into the popular cultural output of the era, consciously, as in the case of Lady Bird, or unconsciously, as in the case of the Carry On films. System building was perfect for a rational, hygienic age. Coventry was the symbol of the Blitz, and here's the rebuilt city centre, the first pedestrianised shopping precinct in the UK. And here's Basil Spence's Coventry Cathedral, a building that annoyed modernists for being too traditional and traditionalists for being too modern. <laughs> we see the spire being winched in by helicopter. <laughs> Ladybird loves the helicopter. This evening, see how many you can count. <laughs> <laughs> No one told the designers of this hotel foyer that one of the principal tenets of modern architecture was that less is more. <laughs> Such was the impurity of modernism when it met the commercial world. Here's a line drawing of Aww. what I like to think of as the Millennium Falcon, obviously <laughs> BBC Television Centre, which opened in 1960. And another icon of British communication, the Post Office Tower, opened in 1966, designed by the Ministry of Works. I went in some of the floors midway up, and to this day, many of them are still full of all that original analogue technology from that time, a time capsule of Ladybird's high-tech 60s world. Here's one of the live birds making a phone call <laughs> in a K8 phone box, introduced in 1968. This is Euston Station in all its streamlined, functionalist glory. The ticket office is also beautiful. Now, Tim is going to talk a lot more about Ladybird's obsession with, obsession with trains later. But it's worth pointing out <laughs> that Kraftwerk's seminal album, Trans Europe Express, was released in 1977, five whole years after the book we just saw was published. Now, industry was another Ladybird obsession, from new technology to production lines, factories and power stations. This world of nationalisation, unionisation and general att uh, genuine attempts at full employment feels rather alien to us in our world of desiccated neoliberal ruin. <laughs> we start with one of the very basic lessons of modernity, the rise of mass production. Throughout the car makers, there are images of the production line of Minis and Austin 1100s, a couple of the biggest success stories for British industry in the period. Then, six years later, a production line making Triumph Toledo's. A hymn to the mechanised world, <laughs> Kraftwerk's seminal album, The Man Machine, was released in 1978, four years after Man and His Car. A helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> the first North Sea oil well was drilled in 1967, a year before this book was published. Ladybird were very good at being topical. Ladybird doesn't shy away from industrial landscapes. The engine room of modernity is not a pretty sight. Thankfully, the mechanised control room has cleaner lines helicopter. <laughs> Farming and food production was revolutionised in the post-war era, not least with the introduction of new chemical fertilisers and pesticides. DDT was first used for pest control in 1939. Sad to say, actual ladybirds were harmed in the making of this. <laughs> <laughs> then there's pylons, which form part of the national grid, set up in 1926. Like a lot of industries, electricity was nationalised after the war. 
Now time for a classic ladybird image, marrying pastoral and progress, a coal-fired power station. These images are from one of the most heartbreaking of all the series, The Public Services. Three books were produced between 1966 and 69. Their happy sadness reminds me of SOS by ABBA. <laughs> the National Grid Control Room looked like the most exciting place in the world. Many magnificent control rooms depicted in Lady Bird books remind me of the famous <coughs> war room set from Dr. Strangelove, designed by Ken Adam. That room never existed, but its image of futuristic omnipotence seems to have inspired industries across Britain. This is the story of nuclear power from 1972, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. <laughs> Here's a case of Ladybird overreaching itself within the format and boiling down a too complex subject into unintelligible text. <laughs> Britain's first atomic power station, called a hall, opened in 1956. If you're a fan of John Pertwee's era, era of Doctor Who, you'll recognize this kind of scene instantly. <laughs> Craftworks, seminal <laughs> album, Radioactivity, wasn't released until 1975, three years after this incredible Ladybird book. Representations of modern culture are another strong suit for Ladybird. From clothes to television, furniture to gadgets, these books catalogue an era in which cheap consumables began to make a big impact on the lives of all of us, thanks to all of that mass production. Oh, hello. Uh, in one of the most mad men of all Ladybird images, <laughs> the story of clothes and costumes perfectly encapsulates the colours, textures and designs of modern fabric, as well as the urban dream of driving out to the green belt for unrestricted leisure. Terrilene, the first polyester fibre, was created in 1941 and became commercially available in the 50s. The story of printing shows decoration being transferred to many modern products, including fabrics and ceramics, bypassing traditional pottery or weaving techniques. Nothing says modern convenience quite like plastic. Polypropylene and expanded polystyrene were invented in 1954. These days, approximately 8 million tonnes of waste plastic enters the Earth's oceans every year. Here we have the basics of 1960s living, from detergents to vinyl records, disposable pens and electric cabling. And just look at all that orange plastic in this 1972 <laughs> kitchen. Orange kitchens were another of those ladybird obsessions. <laughs> Even a mixer tap represents modernity and the thousands <laughs> of families who had escaped from homes which had no hot running water. In 1967, two years before this book was published, there were still almost two million slum dwellings left in England and Wales, and a fifth of houses still had no inside toilet or wash basin. So these images are not to be taken for granted, even if they do look a little like sequences from Homes Under the Hammer. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to live in this room <laughs> with its expensive <laughs> designer furnishings? Many families would have had to settle for their cheaper G-plan equivalents. The bedroom in this illustration almost crackles with static, <laughs> <laughs> setting the perfect scene for a Barry White seduction. <laughs> or if you weren't careful, nylon fueled spontaneous combustion. <laughs> And these end papers will surely be among the most modernist of all Ladybird images. Chairs from significant designers including Sarinen, Jakobsen and Eames. Back in the keywords reading scheme, Daddy likes a bit of Scandinavian design, it seems. <laughs> and even Urkel is here to help. 
the Buckinghamshire based modern furniture designer's work was showcased at the Britain Can Make It exhibition in 1948 and a festival of Britain in 1951. The British Motor Corporation's works canteen is packed with steel leg chairs and formica top tables, mass produced takes on classic Bauhaus designs of the 20s and 30s. These electrical devices were not just the latest models in 1966, many of them were still novel in many homes. The time saved by new domestic appliances is credited as one of the drivers of the women's liberation movement, movement of the 1970s. Today, this image reads like an episode of Casualty, where you're looking around <laughs> to see which might be the first to burst into flames <laughs> due to faulty wiring. My money's on the electric blanket. <laughs> This black and white television is a oh. reminder of, uh, of the vintage of this image. David Attenborough, then controller of BBC Two, oversaw the introduction of four hours of colour TV a day in 1967. How it works, the television is one of the first Lady Bird books to feature a woman using high-tech, non-domestic technology. This 60s girl group on stage in Ready Steady Go are in for a shock. Ladybird shows them miming to a record. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real there's no Santa moment, if ever there was one. Thanks, Ladybird. Technology. So, this is the area of modernization that perhaps we are most likely to associate with Ladybird books, because so many are filled with images of spacecraft, radar, computers, and telephones. Radar and weapon systems were produced in high-tech industries, particularly concentrated in post-war new towns like Stevenage. The Jodrell Bank radio telescope, a ladybird favourite, was depicted in the end papers. The structure was completed in 1957 and was the largest steerable dish in the world. This is Telstar, which in 1962 became the first successful satellite launched by NASA. And here's the journey of Saturn V in 1969. Closer to home, the trim phone went in, into production in 1964. By 1980, 1 1.6 million of us owned them. And we had a green one just like this. This modern switchboard still requires an awful lot of Rolodexes and memo cards. And these devices aren't what you think. They're mechanical adding machines before the computer changed office life forever. How it works, the computer is a hymn to the spool-to-spool -spool era. It's wonderful, a real historical document of the early days of office computing. Silicon chips developed at the end of the 50s changed the size and speed of computers. And here they are, caught in a transitional moment before the birth of the PC and after IBM's declaration that the maximum number of computers needed for the world was five. <laughs> <laughs> My new favorite band. And in many ways, this book sits as close to the Colossus of Bletchley Park as it does to the tablets of today. Great rooms of processors left to get on with it. Craftworks' <laughs> seminal album, Computer World, was released in 1981, 10 years after this Ladybird classic. So as you can see, Ladybird did an incredible job cataloguing the emerging designs and inventions of our post-war world, developments that changed forever the way we live and work. And all before craft work got there too. These images might look cosy or outmoded, but to children of the 1960s and 70s, much of this would have seemed unfamiliar and super modern. Being part of the more progressive end of modernity and not just representing it was central to Ladybird's mission and its success. Well, thank you for listening. I'm off in my helicopter to my <laughs> lovely new home uh, with its orange kitchen to sleep under some nylon sheets with my electric blanket. I love the future. <laughs> thank you.
John, the book I'm waiting for you to write is People at Work, the German techno band. <laughs> <laughs> um, before Helen and Tim speak, I wanted to ask Miriam, who very kindly has just had a baby and written two more books, um, has taken time out between uh, seeing her baby and getting some sleep to come and talk to us. You wrote uh, We Go to the Gallery, which was an artwork which played with the imagery of Peter and Jane but also the kind of the whole way that modern um, art seemed to have developed a kind of cult around it. Do you want to tell us a bit about the inspiration and tell, tell us about the new ones? Um, oh, hello. Uh, yeah, Sarah, I've just taken a break from my child who I just named today, so... Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, he was untitled for three weeks, so... <laughs> um, yes, uh, We Go to the Gallery started as a reaction to art school, I suppose. Um, but it, it, I was just listening to what you were saying about the kind of modernity and the optimism of Ladybird books. So I think We Go to the Gallery, it was a, an unintentional clash between kind of postmodern nihilism as represented by all the art. I don't know, does everyone know what the book is? Or Yeah, okay, so I'm just... <laughs> yeah, it's about sort of these characters going around looking at, at kind of uh, giant vagina paintings and empty rooms. Um, so it was like a, a clash between those two two worlds and it started off as just something that I found really funny which is you know I'm just dissecting it afterwards but I didn't know at the time it was no it was it was brilliantly witty and it, it did seem to make quite an interesting statement about, about well I, I grew up with two artist parents so <laughs> um it, yeah it was a re reaction to being dragged around galleries my whole life <laughs> so, and what yeah. are the, the two new ones that you've just done um I've, I've done two more um taking those characters of like mummy peter and jane and putting them in the modern world in the world that we live in and it's one called we go out which is based on shopping with mother which is really iconic which the plot is let's go out and they go out and then they go back home again. <laughs> Nothing actually happens. They just like go to the butchers and the bakers and etc. Uh, but now I, I took them out and took them to like Poundland and um, you know like the local sex shop and um, just lo loads of uh, just putting those characters in the modern world. And I, I spent the last year painting it, so all the way through my pregnancy, I've been painting that. Excellent. Um, and yeah, and the, I've just finished the books and. Then, a day after I finished the books and they went to print, I went into labour. <laughs> so it's been <laughs> quite a weird few weeks. So, and then the second book is called We Learn at Home. So mummy takes the kids um, out of school because she believes the school to be a uh, fascist um, and then re-educates them fr from the comfort of, of their home <laughs> and into a more progressive mindset. Um, but be oh, if, if I'd have known, I would have shown some pictures from the new ones. But well, we now know that they're coming out. Yeah. So thank yeah. you so much for coming. Okay, really. yeah. Really I, I have to go home because he needs feeding. Feeding. I know. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming and making the time. And it's thank fine. You so much. It's fine. Um, I'd, I'd love to stay and I'll listen to like Helen because I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm well, a big well, fan. Well, stay for as long as you can and um, okay, yeah. slip out when you need to. Another, like, thank minutes. you so much, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Helen Day, over to you. Well, I don't know whether um, we've all fallen here victim to too many Ladybird books as children, but I think we've slightly fallen into a few stereotypes here, with Tim and John talking about architecture and hard engineering and uh, transport, and I'm going to be talking about relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if the Daily Mail or any newspaper were going to um, do a story about ladybird books, which they do from time to time, how would they illustrate it? Well, my bet is something like that. And yet, we've just had a very entertaining 20 minutes listening to John showing us some very, very different images of ladybird. So what I thought I'd do this evening is sort of to give you a bit of an overview about how that all fits together. Because for me, Ladybird books began in the war. It began in the Second World War. And they carry on printing these books and having tremendous success throughout the 20th century. Um, but you don't get one snapshot. What you get are currents moving through. And what I find interesting is observing those um, through the imagery and to an extent through the text as well. So 
That's what the Daily Mail would project in their article about ladybird books. That's not what you saw in John's pictures, nor I think what you're going to see in Tim's. So I basically split it up into three. We've got the war to the immediate po um, post-war years, and then the real period of what I call enthusiasm, the enthusiastic period, and then finally the period that I call anxious. Now, Ladybird books were, in every sense, the product of war. So the company that printed them started printing children's books, rather than car brochures, during the First World War. But the books that we think of as Ladybird books, those small ones, um, were first printed in the Second World War, and again, directly as a result of paper shortages, which is why they're so small. So what struck me after a years of looking at these books was that actually, from 1940 right up until the 1970s, there are almost no actual representations of the war. And when you think back, you think, there must be. But there's the occasional spitfire or a tank, and that's it. Now, this is the first Ladybird book. It's um, pretty representative of what Ladybird were putting out in their first decade or so. And you might think that there's not much room here for bombs. We've got lots of stories of Mrs. Bunny going to market, going shopping, and she's not going to take her ration book, is she? Here are the... Um, the end papers from that first book. But Angusine McGregor, who illustrated this, had written and illustrated lots of books before. And here's one that she had illustrated a few years before for a different publisher. <laughs> Here we have Mrs. Bunny, off to market with her ration book. Um, but she's uh, on the way to market having to take a few precautions. <laughs> and indeed, before the uh, classic Ladybird book production, Ladybird had done a few books for children. And here are some A's for the alphabet. We've got A is for um, an armoured train. And then later, in about the 1920s, we've got A stands for ambulance train. Lots of trains, you see, always trains. But the uh, ambulance trains were the trains that were specially sort of commissioned to bring the wounded soldiers back from the front. Yet, for the first decade or so of Ladybird, that's not what we see. The war is there, I think, but it's there through retreat. The world that they project is this semi-rural, rural, completely stable society. But that begins to change in the 1950s. And I think to quite an extraordinary extent, we can attribute that to actually the conception and vision of one man. Now this is Douglas Keane. And Douglas Keane rose through the ranks during the 1940s, when they began book publication, he was away fighting, and when he came back, he didn't have much influence in the company. From the 1950s, he begins to have more and more influence, and right up until the company is sold in the mid-70s, it's quite hard for us today to imagine how a company that has the success of Lady Bird can be so much one-man show, at least not in the production, but in the conception and the content of what was produced. So who was he, and how does he represent these post-war years? Well, Douglas Keane was, had a completely unladybird book childhood. So he was brought up by a single parent, relationships were a bit dysfunctional, he's looking for work and struggling to find it during the, uh, the Depression. He wants to be an architect, but the education isn't there. So he gets a job for this printing company and is traveling around the country and seeing real poverty, which had a lasting effect on him, as did the war years. Now, Douglas Keane was a humanist. Douglas Keane 
was a socialist. And he, in fact, described himself as one of only two Marxists living in Stratford-on-Avon. <laughs> now, in the 19, early 1950s, sort of fresh from the Festival of Britain, where he comes back enthused with what is seen there and what, with what's happening in Britain. And imagine, this is the time when suddenly he's, got, he's, he's living in a world where you've got the National Health Service, the Education Act, welfare state. What can't we accomplish? And this frustrated architect finally has the money and he builds his own house. So how does he furnish it? Victoriana? Edwardiana? No. Urkel, G-plan, fitted furniture. These wonderful new materials of plywood and chipboard. And you can see, as John has shown, how this love of the modern interior and the rejection of the past flows through the books right up to the 1980s. I think it's best summed up now here, and I'm cheating a bit, because this picture doesn't come from a ladybird book. It comes from a puffin picture book of the same era. Now, you probably can't quite get a flair for that charm of that lovely post-war um, interior, but I'm going to just show you the, the text that goes with the picture, especially that last line. It gets me every time when I get to the end. And we don't have more than is necessary, so that there is more room to move about. We have discovered that people are more important than things. So this is the world that Lady Bird is so enthusiastic about showing us, a world where we've learned the lessons of the past, we've learned the lessons of the war, and we can move forward into this exciting future. And even in the nature books, as I think John actually mentioned, you can see this sort of slight transition going on here in this stunning artwork of C.F. Tunnicliffe. And there's very, very little sign of human, human beings in this, very little mechanization, but what there is, do you notice? It's really compatible. Can you see there's a car, the car in the background there, just disappearing on the horizon and the tractor, and there's these lovely soft autumnal hues, sort of harmonizing with nature. So as we move through the 60s and into the 70s, still, where's the war? Robert Louis Stevenson gets a book to himself. Elizabeth Gaskell gets a book to herself. Winston Churchill gets one page. No, the world we're moving into is the world where very soon Peter and Jane will be taking the space bus. It's a world where, I show this picture sometimes, it's a bit smaller because I thought John was going to show it, but can you see, people look at it and think that this must be one of those pictures that they show spot all the trip hazards. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it isn't. It's, it's a full of exuberance and enthusiasm for the labor-saving devices that ele electricity is bringing to all, not just to a few. And the wonderful excitement of new technologies. And here you can see these peaceful seagulls and the peaceful research at Dune Ray. <laughs> and of course, those wonderful, graceful pylons. There you go. Graceful steel pylons stretch across the fields, taking electricity to towns and villages. Not to a few, but to all. This is one of my favorites. Oil, written in the 1970s. Now, think about oil in the 1970s. What's Ladybird's take on it? Well, we've got some very intelligent chaps and a few intelligent chapesses working with working on oil to end world hunger. Oil is going to make the deserts fertile, we are told, and these wonderful plastics are going to build these exciting new worlds in space. 
even literacy and the inequalities of literacy are going to be evened out by the application of scientific process. The keyword reading scheme is going to help even the playing field in terms of learning to read. And so we have Peter and Jane come onto the stage. Now, these books in particular were envisaged to be quite a contrast to the fictional children that had come before them. So these children don't go to boarding school. They don't have a nanny. They go to the local co-ed co comprehensive around the corner. They live in a terraced house. They um, don't have a television until about 1974. Um, but very quickly, these pictures look very, very dated. And they were updated at great expense in just a few years after they'd been published. And since I'm talking about the currents that flow through Lady Bird, I find it fascinating, actually, when you take an updated version of the book from one decade, the same page, the same book, a different decade. What was it that was unacceptable in the later decade, uh, in the earlier one, that had to be amended um, in the later one? For example, sometimes it was very simple. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> But more often, it was a bit more subtle. So for example, if you are trying to break down the complex concept of your society to children, but not in a way that's patronizing, you have to make a decision about how to portray things. So for example, what does a villain look like? What does a baddie look like? Well, this is what John um, Berry decided when he was illustrating The Policeman in 1961. Here we have the, the villain, white, middle class, uh, sorry, middle aged, flat cap. By the 1970s, that's unacceptable. Now, <laughs> a villain has to have long hair and a walrus moustache. This is from the Peter and Jane books, and this is the 1964 version. So you're going to be editors now. What is it about this picture which is going to be unacceptable, and you're going to have to, at great expense, re-illustrate it? Have you seen it yet? That water Open is water. too deep. <laughs> <laughs> You see, it wasn't the costume. Jane was already fairly sensibly dressed for once in jeans and boots. No, the water, can you see here, is about two inches deep. So here it's been lowered by about an inch. But more importantly, parental supervision. <laughs> and that's one of the, I could show you countless examples of this throughout. Kids stopped being on their own without supervising adults. One thing I find quite interesting, though, is this one. Now, this is the revised book. In the 1960s book, Jane's wearing her preposterous, bright, clean, white frock. 1970s, they put her in jeans. But that's the only change they make. The children get caught in a rainstorm, and a van pulls up. That still sends shivers down my spine. <laughs> and I was trying to check to see whether that book is still on sale today. I don't know whether they've changed that now. But the perception of risk and of danger in the 1970s is very different from today. They did have a little look at the uh, portrayal of women, and there was some amendments to mother's role, but not a lot, actually, between the 60s and the 70s. Can you see mother here in the background with the tray disappearing into the kitchen? So we're going to re-illustrate this now for the 1970s, and I want you to 
spot mother. <laughs> no, not that one, that's her daughter. Yes, a television has now arrived. And there's mother, just kicking off her shoes in front of it. Now, Lady Bird were a bit slow off the mark to respond, I would say to respond to a responsibility to portray society, not just as it happened to be under the noses of the artists, but uh, as Britain was changing, they were rather slow to represent that. But in the 1970s, a big effort was made to expand uh, Peter and Jane's social circle. But generally, what you get, I think, is a, a feeling from the books, a feeling that we've moved from the 1950s to a rather more chaotic world. The speed has sort of, everything's speeded up, hasn't it? And family life. gets a bit more complicated. Now, I would love to leave Ladybird there. I would love to say that's where the story ends. We want to leave Ladybird in this wonderfully enthusiastic world, um, introducing us to the wonders of asbestos and the potential of nuclear power. But if we're going to see the curve, we have to see where it starts curling off, because... By the 1970s, Douglas Keane was getting old. He wanted to retire. It was a big strain. But the world was also under more apparent strain, too. He was very, very struck by the writings about the planet, a blueprint for survival. He was very, very struck by the, the, the Pugwash conferences. And Suddenly, we're in a world now where you've got oil crises, you've got industrial difficulties. Um, it's a less uh, uh, pollution and the environmental damage. The potential of this was becoming more and more apparent. Suddenly, in the books, you can see everything is being questioned, even in the books for very, very young children. What are we doing to the planet? In fact, the books produced at this period are the most evangelistic of all. The subtly named, what on earth are we doing? An interesting list was sort of Douglas Keane's parting shot as he retires, and the company is sold to a large conglomerate. It's also the only book that he actually puts his name to. And hovering over everything by this stage, it's not so much peaceful seagulls at Dunray anymore. So to sum up, Lady Bird starts in 1940, and they produce, in that period, 600 books, maybe more, each one with 24 beautifully crafted, detailed, crammed illustrations. So that leaves us with an archive of something like 15,000 images of the 20th century. And how we see those images, I think, is quite important. Because basically, when you have 15,000 pictures, let alone the text, you can tell any story you want to tell. If you want to tell the story of a workplace made up only of men, where with women in the kitchen, or if they're in the workplace, purely decorative, you can use Ladybird book pictures to tell that story. Alternatively, if you want to look a bit deeper and see the roles where women really are strongly portrayed, and are they still the same? The, uh, highly skilled work of the potteries, for example, or how many women are represented in the computing industry in the early days. You can certainly tell that story, too. 
if you want to look at how the racial mix of Britain and the perception of that racial mix changed over the decades, you can certainly tell that story. Or if you want to just look at the very pretty nostalgic pictures and think about boys and girls, you can do that, but then look a bit deeper and compare that to quite how gendered childhood can be today. And then think, well, hang on, where's the blue and the pink? Especially the pink. Where's the pink? And then you look at what the boys are doing and you think, hang on, actually, today, a lot of the things that that little boy is doing, they'd be a bit girly. If you want to find pictures of boys doing housework, you can find that. If you want to find girls working in the garden, you can do that. And certainly, if you want to find pictures of girls and boys operating equally in science and technology experiments, you can certainly do that. So I would say, this is a wonderful archive that can give, tell us a tremendous and nuanced picture about currents through the second half of the 20th century. And if we sort of sum it all up with a word like nostalgic or utopian, we ourselves, I think, are in danger of stereotyping ladybird books. Lovely. Thank you. Helen, thanks very much. Right, Tim, let's have some gendered <laughs> male transport. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> right. Thank you all for coming. I was born in 1981, I know, incredible, I know, in a pleasant suburban Buckinghamshire town. I was the product of Metroland, just a mile from the M25. I went to prep school, I went to grammar school. I was, to use current parlance, privileged. I was privileged too because my dad as a chartered surveyor and my mum as a window dresser fed me with information, opportunity and inspiration. Some of that came from holidays around Britain and abroad, but a lot of that came from books. An awful lot of train books, I must be said, <laughs> hence my persisting obsessions, but also a lot of ladybird books. Because ladybird books were, to me, little encyclopedias. Not the complex Encyclopedia Britannica that we'd lift from the shelves of the hushed research section of Charlton St. Peter Library above the photocopier, but singular accessible gateways explaining the world I lived in. Gateway drugs to harder, darker stuff. They existed, those in Ladybird books, didn't they? On the shelves of every schoolroom, in every friend's house that we probably had. You could tell instantly, I think, what your friend's parents wanted those children to know when you saw a Ladybird collection. Because kids didn't buy Ladybird books. Parents bought Ladybird books. Ladybird books were a safe pair of hands, an extra trusted teacher in a specific area of expertise. My first Ladybird book was from my mum. Things to make and do. It was either hers or bought from a charity shop in the village, but my God, this was terrifying, this image. I put this on the screen now actually for therapy for myself because <laughs> I flicked past this every single time. I kept those pages tightly shut because that image staring out at me would still haunt me as I put the book back in the bookshelf. But, we, 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 but that was my therapy. Now, in the early 1980s, my life really was actually a ladybird book. I'll be honest about it, out in Buckinghamshire. Even my 1955 copy of Ladybird on a Train by Uncle Mac really was relevant. Sure, my train that took me from Gerard Cross to my aunt and uncle up at Marylebone had signalmen. My train had a compartment, but it was diesel, and we'd get the train to Marylebone and hop on an ancient, dimly lit little underground train. The world that I was experiencing was made simple. 
and explained by Ladybird. These early books are comforting. They are saying, we are stable, we are fine, everything is fine. <laughs> now, Buckinghamshire is deeply conservative, with a capital C and a lower C, and Lady Burke's, Lady Burke's on one level, played to that. A 50s or 60s book in 80s bucks is very conservative. They explain in simple terms how the world works, or it's how to navigate systems or networks, like the underground, for simple people from Buckinghamshire. They don't talk about the future that often, those early years, but they really do help you understand it and imply what's going to happen in the future. So if there was modernity, it was happening elsewhere. Now, if we look at the end quote here, fortunately, we can be proud of our railways. Now, that wasn't the case in the 1980s at Gerald Cross, certainly, and I wasn't very proud of the railway that was outside my front door. But I live around the corner from Beckenscott Model Village, and those of you who know me on Twitter will know that I am obsessed about model villages, because this model village of Beckenscott I ended up working there for 20 years. A model village is a living embodiment of a Ladybird book. Indeed, this was the cl closest, uh, so th this was actually created by a closet socialist to show his ideals. It's a really good way in three dimensions of showing the good things, the interesting things in life, the systems and how they work, unquestioned. And outside Bucks, the world's modernising, but not here at Beckenscott, and not here at home, and not in my early Ladybird books. And the status quo is comfortable. It is socialist, but unthreateningly modernist, but it's just nudging around the corner. The new tech is beneficial. It's safe, it's understandable, it's friendly. And I had, like I'm sure many of you did, a book called Tootles the Taxi. <laughs> now, Tootles the Taxi, uh, little poems about happy, efficient forms of transport, including, of course, Timbo the Trolley Bus. A trolley bus as a child in the 1980s, these things have been gone from our streets for 20 years. These Lady Bird books were starting to feel to me like history, not the future not encyclopedias, but the past. Little wonder that the same artist did those pictures of, of Timbo the trolley bus and of, of uh, the, the taxi, did Thomas the Tank Engine as well at certain points, John Kenny. And for, I'm still trying to recreate some of John Kenny's artwork today for the front covers when I go play trains at weekends. But it's a quick note on the broad appeal of the artwork of Ladybird books. This is from On the Railways, and this was actually nicked by Emirates Postal Service as a stamp to depict their own network, United Emirates Emirates. And I think it's against, you know, to some of these, the, 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 the style of illustration at the time being used by Transport Aid, the British Transport Commission used a very similar style of artwork to kind of predict a future. This kind of adult-focused illustration of Banbury Station here. Well, Banbury never looked like that. It was never supposed to look like that in reality. But it was the idea and the concept of the state-owned railway portraying something they wanted to be seen in the future, what it should look like. It never really happened. But that's really what Early Ladybird represents to me. It's a vision of the recent past, an unequivocal statement of fact. It's not to be questioned, it is precise. The prose is always definite. Enthusiastic, sometimes, but always definite. Later books we've talked about, this, uh, uh, they're not just definite, they're complex. They're the authority. They're deadly serious for something important. They're exciting, you must remember this. These books are written by the present administration. The adults in charge right now are writing these books. They are briefing notes for the next generation, for us sitting here. These How It Works books are there to say, this is what it is. This is what we have achieved. This is the status quo. Now take this forward, children. You must take these, because we are stable and we are fine. Everything is fine. But your mission, child of Britain, is to take this project and continue it. By reading this book implicitly, you are part of this mission and you've accepted it. There were instructions for driving a hovercraft. <laughs> I don't know how often you've had to drive a hovercraft. <laughs> Uh, I have once, and I'm very glad I read the book. Um, <laughs> but you must remember, this was at a time when Britain had a nationalised network of hovercraft routes. It was relevant. Now, the people at work books are beautiful, and they're briefing notes for our 70s and 80s future. I didn't know this world. I didn't know Euston Station. But I knew Marylebone. It was a Victorian complex. I didn't know these were all control boxes. 
because my world was a more rural, suburban world. This was something different. But that world, outside Buckinghamshire, was changing. We look at one of the earlier books here. Luxurious airliners fly to every part of the world. The age of air travel has come. Well, when I got to this book, that was already very old. And that was out of date by 15, 20 years. And the books were changing. Airports had grown from being a luxurious thing to a more of a commodity, democratised. It was different. They showed efficient airports to the real masses. Now, they tried to update the artwork, as Helen pointed out. Subtle changes to make the transport change. See there, it's an old underground train, a newer one, the Victoria Line, I think it is. They tried to update the artwork, but I think we stopped listening to what we were being told. Of all the books of transport I reread over the past few weeks for this, rail, air, sea, cars, commercial vehicles, boats, hovercraft, helicopters, they're almost all treated with optimism and excitement, apart from one method of transport, just one. That's the car. They hate the car with a passion, almost throughout. Now, this one from Man, His Car, a Ladybird leader from 74 and from Rhodes, This is the first depiction, I think, of probably road rage in Great Britain. <laughs> but also, it's always definite, if not disparaging, about the method of transport. <laughs> <laughs> and that style of illustration, I think, changes as you move through as well. But again, it's a definite statement. And then again, as we've talked about how, how Kenny moved forward and he made it into more anxious. I think actually perhaps it warns the reader, next, what happens. We talked about the car parks under buildings and how the roads are being clogged up. But the optimism by the 1970s is waning. Again, it's definite, it's factual, it's about humans, and against man pitched against car, about the world. It's worrying us. But who can blame the team behind Ladybird Books for the optimism waning? By this point, of this series, 1970s, we should have been on Mars and Venus. We weren't. We should have had tracked hovercraft networks crisscross the United Kingdom. Didn't have them. We still don't have them, much to my chagrin. We should have had self-drive dinospheres up and down the streets. <laughs> Not a ladybird book picture, I, I, I know. And we should have had Concorde twice daily today. We don't have that. And we should have gas turbine trains across this country, 150 miles an hour, tilting in and out of the curves, British built things in a non-Brexit way, of course. Um, but we don't. So I put it to this house in front of me, the assembled people who come celebrate Ladybird Books, I think, here today, that those Ladybird Books were the briefing notes for Britain. They were here for us, and I think we've forgotten them. They were instruction manuals to build a better future. But we threw them away. And now it's time to bring them back. Thank you. <laughs> oh, fantastic stuff. Thank you all so much. Um, the key question for me in putting this um, event together now and looking at all these illustrations through your eyes is I feel there is something about the climate that led up to the referendum which seemed to be harking back to a nostalgic, that select nostalgic view of, of a ladybird uh, bookland of the past. Um, and I wondered what you all made of, of that nostalgia now and particularly around things like the full employment we see, uh, a thriving public sector, um, and also, I suppose, in a certain way, although, as you pointed out, Helen, not necessarily true, a selective vision of a less diverse Britain. I was looking at the agricultural workers, and I was thinking, oh, I wonder if they're from Eastern Europe. Um, but, you know, all those images now have real potency. What are your thoughts around Brexit Britain and the Ladybird world of things? Well, I think a lot of the, the things that I really... A lot of the Ladybird images I really like and a lot of the books that I really like are actually, you know, showing a kind of form of modernisation that's exactly the kind of modernisation that's been rejected by the kind of Brexit 
the world. I feel like, you know, there's, you know, a lot of, you know, the sort of, the, the idea of Europe being a kind of, you know, a massive kind of complex, technically maintained, difficult thing. You know, it could so easily have been the next book after the nuclear power one. Well, you could have had, you couldn't have how it works, the European Union, couldn't you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, fascinating, all the John Berry illustrations yeah. of the Parliament using <laughs> punch-ups. Um, Helen, what are your thoughts about Well, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's sort of at the heart of what I was trying to say, really, in my talk. I think that whole sort of Daily Mail projection of, what, of, of, of nostalgia is completely to misrepresent that in its own time frame, this was not nostalgic. This was questing, this was seeking to move forward, this was modernism. And um, I, I hate the thought that these images are being seized on today and recast. And uh, that, I dislike that thought immensely. Uh, Tim, I was thinking, particularly with those projects like HS1 and 2, um, which are quite controversial, mm. and the Garden Bridge, which is the most controversial of all, yes. how they look to you in the light of the, the sort of vision of, of transport and planning you saw in Ladybird books? Well, I suppose uh, the Garden Bridge has no point or function, um, and so therefore would have no place in, in a Ladybird book other than the history section of it. Um, in, 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 in a similar way, I think that, that you know, HS1 potentially has a scientific reason behind it. I mean, I like fast trains. I want that to be built for lightning trains. Um, but I, I think that was a, if there's a rational reason for something being, if there's a scientific reason, it might have a place in the book. Um, if I look back at the transport books, you go back into Asia, the glorification of some of those old networks and the, the branch line railways, they're sort of laughed at. You know, they mentioned some of those transport books, how the old branch line railways were being sort of, you know, the, the, the old Mr. Porter style stuff is being pushed back and saying, this is, this, is, this is a defunct world. They're not necessary. What is useful is the modern high speed railway to convey people in a short amount of time for business and, and, and for and a democratic way. And that is the one slightly chilling aspect in some of the old Ladybird books. And there's an image, Helen. And I, you know, it's like our equivalent of that mask, which is our land in the making. This one, <laughs> and I won't be able to show it big because I've only got it in here. But it's they show you a flooded Norman village to make way for a dam, which is based on a real Welsh village, isn't it, Helen? And and it's sort of implied as well. This is just progress. And I don't know if it's it's show. I don't know if you can see enough of it. No, but there's there's your modern dam, and there's the, the Norman church with fish swimming around, and it's so terrifying. But yes, I think the. The, the text of it is, you know, um, water is essential to life and, you know, it's sort of bringing progress. This, it, it is the one thing which I suppose you could argue Thatcher argued against, which was this centralised socialist vision of central planning, which was neo-Soviet, which was seen as a terrible thing, actually, in some ways. Um, and there's a hint of it, isn't there, in some of those stories? I think there's a bit of a conflict going on here because I think it's as if the artwork is telling you one story... And the text is telling you another sometimes. So you've got this Norman church, and I, I don't know, village life has, has sort of been this rock of ages, this factor of stability and this green and pleasant land, and we flooded it. And you can just see, just feet below the surface, this Norman church. And the text tells us that this is a wonderful, positive thing. But our instincts tell us that's a church underwater. And it had a powerful effect on me. I think it did on you mm. too, didn't it? And ever since now, I drive past a reservoir. Sometimes if it's summer, and it, you can see the water levels down a bit, I, I still think, you know, I'm going to see the tower of that church um, just rising above the sur surface. And uh, I think that shows that tension that was going on with the desire for a better future which involved technology which would level society and yet still holding on to what we value about this country, what we identify with. And I see that in the text and the picture. Well, certainly it's something like the demolition of the old Euston Station, which is still hugely controversial, mm. that whole movement around the early 20th century about preservation versus modernisation, mm. which was quite toxic, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you do see, you do see some elements of that conflict. And, you know, there is a peculiar thing with Ladybird books, I think, in that, you know, if you know them, you know, if you looked at them when you were a child and then you look at them now, you sort of have a simultaneous kind of two things going on at once. You have that kind of the memory of what you thought then and the shock of what you see now. It's not always the thing you thought it was. 
And also in that Outland in the Making, you know, you showed that you had that image at the beginning of the motorway, oh, the, the you know, and the yeah. village. You know, to some people that would be, hooray, progress, we've got, and to other people that would be, oh my God, you know, I can just see the kind of NIMBY protest behind that image, you know, as well as the kind of technocratic dream of it at the same time. One of the things I think that happens with some of the Ladybird books, and I think when they do become slightly detached, is because they are what they are often certainly the, you know the, the how it how it works or whatever that sort of you know that that strand of book is they talk about one subject and sometimes when you get so obsessed in that one subject you kind of lose the context around it really so we can now you know put together these presentations and bring together loads of different stuff and it tells you a slightly bigger rounder story but actually if you only read the story of nuclear power you know, it's sort of terrifying. Although I noticed that, um, you know, the image you showed of, of the power plant, there's a perfect blue sky. And that's part of the, what's mm. interesting about the books is the very optimistic blue skies that illustrate progress. Whereas in some of the later books you were showing with the, the road network, it's a cloudy sky, mm. a completely cloudy over sky. I think it was quite significant. I just wanted to mention one other thing before I take your questions, which is um, uh, the, the journalist and writer Matt Potter um, to message me about the book, which is um, the story of rocks and minerals. And he was quite fascinated by all these materials that were being lauded for their amazing new properties, uh, like lead and um, asbestos. And, this. <laughs> and I just wanted to read from the beginning of the page on asbestos. Asbestos looks more like a plant than a mineral from the earth. It is nature's rock wool, because it is made of soft, silky fibres, which can be easily pulled apart. <laughs> and I think part of the the fascination with these books is the stuff that now we know is terrifyingly yeah. damaging. Yeah. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Now, what is it that, you know, 40 years in the future, people are going to be looking back at what we're writing today, you know, with that knowledge and recasting that? Are there any um, horror images for you? Do each of you have a... I mean, it's your mask, isn't it? It's that motor's mask, still. What do you, what, what's your horror book or, or image? I find the underwater images really, really disturbing. The, the bathosphere image. That's a in really under famous word. Yeah, undersea exploration. Undersea yeah, exploration. I can't really read undersea exploration. The whole thing, you know, I sort of feel like I'm drowning. I can't, I can't do it. What about for you, Helen? Yeah, it's a, a toss-up, really, between the sunken village and underwater exploration. Where, yeah, uh, for me, it's not the uh, bathosphere. It's, there's a ship, I think it's the Royal George, which sinks. And then a little bit later, there's a, an aeroplane, BOAC, Yoke the comet. Peter or something, yeah. yeah. Do you remember that one? And yeah. you see it on the bottom of the sea. Which but there's this green piece surrounding this really terrifying image. Mm -hmm. Disaster. Um, and do you have a favourite each? Well, I mean, I keep going on about the nuclear power one. I sort of hate <laughs> it and I love it. I, you know, it, the text, for me, the text doesn't make much sense. You know, it is trying to do the impossible. And, but there is something so heroic about it, and the illustration style is so amazing in it. I mean, the builder, I love the builder. That's a much more obvious kind of, you know, straightforward thing, just because they could easily have just stuck with traditional building techniques, because there was certainly enough to say about those. And that's, in our memory, that is what Ladybird books are, is telling you that stuff. But actually, amazing, great, we're going to see a steel frame, we're going to see, you know, you know, all these kind of system building happening. And you, you know, I th so, you know, I think both of those I, I love. Tim, what about for you? Do you have a favourite? It's probably that high-speed train, <laughs> the, the APT Hilton train, because that is where Ladybird kind of stopped with, it, with it, its idea of transport. That was the end. That was the future. But it never really Should happened. I tell you what he said, through about the APT? So my husband grew up in Cheshire, in, near Hartford, which is where it was um, near Crewe, so a lot of rail executives lived there. And his school were taken to stand on the platform to watch the APT go by for the first time. And they all stood there, like, really excited, and then it crawled by really slowly because <laughs> it wasn't working. <laughs> and there you go, there was your future. What about you, Helen? Um, well, if I'm absolutely honest, I'd have to do what, what John was talking about. What, what was my favourite as a child, I have to say, it was probably one of the fairy tales. Um, I'm being gendered again, aren't I, you see? Too many ladybird books. <laughs> Cinderella. Um, but Cinderella. Yes. Sleeping Beauty. But uh, if I'm allowed to sort of say, as, a, as an adult now, what I, I, I get the most from is probably the John Berry People at Work series. Mm. I'm just com absolutely fascinated by his artwork and that sort of relationship between reality and photo reality. Well, we were talking about this uh, backstage. I used to read The Miner and The Shipbuilder to my 
children who were born, you know, 1999 and 2001, and these were industries that had disappeared. Um, so there was a poignancy to that. But also, um, the fact that they had this matte quality, and I was talking to um, filmmakers about virtual reality and digital HD, and the thing about digital HD is it looks like a video shot in your house. There's nothing powerful. It's that matte quality to film that makes it dreamlike, and it's the matte quality to those illustrations that make the reality of that era dreamlike, and I think go deep into our imaginations. Do we have some questions? Right, got one over there. I've got a mic if you just wait for it to come. Do any of the Ladybird books deal with the world outside of Britain? Do they deal with the mm. world outside of Britain? There is some stuff I've seen on the roads where, I didn't put it in, there's an image, again, at the end of the, of the book here, um, they talk about how cars and, and how, how terrible they are, but it gets to kind of an apogee of, of awfulness, where it gets to cars and crime. Uh, is it cars are there to create crime, and uh, it's set in America, and it's a police car chasing, uh, or a getaway car as well. So almost implying that you know, the, 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 the end of the car story ends that they're being used to create terrible, terrible things. So certainly there are things I think that, that bring in some of the, the, the American stuff, but I haven't seen a lot of stuff. Well, there's the, the, the mammal things. There's but the flight series, yeah. so that the, which are remember, well the dodgy, flight series is the product of the 1950s, and really the, the artists themselves have never been to these countries, <laughs> so um, they have this sort of rather sort of post-colonial uh, feel to them. But they've been obviously painted from postcards. Um, there's uh, how could you forget Holland? Come to Holland yeah. and the model, yeah. the only a few, depiction of a model Denmark, village. Holland and, and <laughs> France. That's right. Um, but uh, the, what I find peculiar is that this, they are focused on Britain, but they were actually translated and sold all over the world. So you can go to China. You know, you can go to you know Egypt and pick up. How it works, the rock. But they repainted over one of the um, musician animals. Sometimes, sometimes they've been slightly adapted for a different market, admittedly, but it does bother me sometimes the selection that they've made, how this incredibly, I'll say, Anglo centric representation is translating, really. But it, they seem to have sold in thousands. Yeah, but the it, flight series, as we're checking out, it is quite on PC, I think it's fair to say. Is um, they, they go off to, to Egypt or they go off, off, they off go to, off to Africa. Africa? They go off to Africa, yes, they go off to South Africa. God knows what they say. But, but, but most of it's actually about the flight <laughs> itself, not about the country. You know. <laughs> well, I've already told Helen the one that sits in my mind is the one they go to America and they go to the Deep South and there's a Negro sitting at the bottom of the garden at the plantation house playing his banjo um, and singing his beautiful, mournful song. And you think this is the late 1950s and you know, there's bus protests going on in Alabama. Um, so there you go. Right, lady on the aisle there. You've got another mic. Sorry, no, don't show it, it'll come round. Uh, just in the blue cardigan halfway down. There you go. This is probably a question mainly for Helen, but the others may have views. Um, given their socio-economic background and their ages, I guess they probably would have been born in the mid 50s. Do we think Peter and Jane voted Brexit? <laughs> 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 Well, I feel personally involved here because Peter and Jane were born in 1964, as was I. Right, so I feel I can speak for them. But they were children in. So they're Generation <laughs> Xs. They would have well, they were born. Ten, they were sort of born six years old, whereas I was a bit more conventional about the whole birth process. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these are very much the. The brainchild, they were not written by Douglas Keane, but he was very enthusiastic about the process. And I think we would have to imbue them with his humanistic outlook. So I would be, think he would be very, very reluctant. In fact, I think, do we have his daughter here? I think perhaps she might be better placed to speak. Is that Caroline there? Hello, Caroline. Would you I don't know if you mind me putting you on the spot here, yeah. but my instinct is he would be horrified at the thought of Peter and Jane being used in the same breath as Brexit. I think he would. He was very much a humanist. He was so interested in the rest of the world and everybody working together. I think the idea of the antagonism that there is that's resulted from Brexit would have absolutely horrified him. He, he, as, humanism was at the basis um, of the way he thought. And he had this absolute curiosity for everything that was going on in the rest of the world. He read very widely. Um, and he, during the time that he was editor of those books, he was traveling a lot and using all the knowledge 
um, and the reading uh, that he had acquired. And just going back, if I can carry on a little bit, um, when he first started working for Ladybirds, when it was Wills and Hepworth back in the 1930s, when they were just purely producing color printing, he was based in Birmingham, having been brought up, as you said, in Cheltenham, very much rural England with the background of the Cotswolds, pastoral life, interest in birds, which was why the bird book was one of the first ladybirds that came out under his uh, um, control, if you like. Um, he moved to, he took the job with Wills and Hepworth, um, and he was selling color printing in the Midlands. He was working with Leyland, with Rover, with Raleigh, of BOAC, all these people. He was right there in the heart of the, of the transport um, at the time. After the war, when he came back to Ladybirds, he was then sidelined onto selling the books, which they thought would die out once the color printing commercial side of things caught up again. Um, and to do that, he was traveling the length and breadth of the country. He was going from Margate to Glasgow, from Norwich to Truro, from Cardiff to Dublin. He was traveling on the train, he was driving, he was using boats, he was seeing the whole country, he was talking to people, he was interested in everybody he met. And that's where his understanding came from of what was going on and trying to make the connections and trying to inspire everybody else in what was happening in post-war Britain. Terrific. Thank you so much. I think that's quite a good place to end. It is nine o'clock where we need to finish. Um, but thank you so much. Thank, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks for some great questions. And thank you to John Greengrod, Helen Day and Tim Dunn.